All right, good morning everybody and welcome to the Connective Asset Finance Workshop. My name is Brent Sternberg. Uh, for those that don't know who I am, I'm the head of Connective Asset Finance. Um, give you a little bit of a background on, on who I am and how we got to where we are to today. Uh, basically, uh, I've been with Connective for about eight and a half years. I started off as the sales manager for Victoria. So for those that uh, would know Lara Mackay in, in Victoria, I used to do her role. Um, uh, I then stepped into the compliance role, did that for about three and a half years. So when compliance reared its ugly head, I did that. I uh, still don't know why, but I did. Uh, so three and a half years I did that for, and then uh, an opportunity came up to look after the asset finance side of the business. It was a newly created role. Um, I put my hand up for it and took on the role. Uh, it was a natural fit for me because I'd spent 10 years in the car trade prior to joining Connective. So a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today will be some of the experiences that I went through when I was in the car industry. Um, and obviously did those things in the car industry. So we'll talk about a lot of that sort of thing, just so it helps you understand what you're gonna be up against when you're talking to clients in this, uh, in this space. So what is Connective Asset Finance? Uh, Connective Asset Finance is actually the ability for you as mortgage brokers to be able to offer asset finance to your clients without holding any accreditations with any of the lenders, okay? Uh, we also have those that have direct accreditations as well, so we have both sides of the story. But basically what we've done is we've partnered up with a company that's helped us put together a software platform called Bolt. And what Bolt does is it allows us to be able to give to you, uh, our, our brokers and our partners, access to all the various different lenders that we've got in the asset space. So Bolt allows you to quote different lenders based on the different types of scenarios, so whether that be cars, trucks, trailers, jet skis, motorbikes, cranes, uh, machinery, things like that. It also gives you access to all the various different lenders through that. You can then generate your quote and your commissions. Uh, that was also a, then an application tool. So that then goes through to the application process. It goes to our processing team and they actually package it and vet it and make sure it actually hits the lender in a way that's suitable for them because it is very different to the mortgage space. Okay. Um, so basically that's what Bolt is. It also provides you, uh, provides your client I should say, with an electronic privacy form so it actually speeds up that process. Uh, typically what happens is you'll find that a lot of other places would require you to do a handwritten signature, it's like a wet ink, uh, whereas we actually work off an electronic privacy form. So basically once you hit that submit button, it goes through to the client at the end via a text message. So they'll get a text message on their mobile phone, they click the link, they sign it, they agree to the terms and that's the privacy form done. So as far as time goes, it's almost instantaneous. Okay, so it, does, it doesn't hold up the whole process. Um, you'll get kept up to date through the process as well. And through the Bolt system, there's a My App section that'll allow you to check on the status of, your, of all your deals. So you'll be able to check the status of the deals that you've started and haven't submitted. You'll be able to check the deals that are actually submitted and where they're at throughout the process of going to the lender, chasing the invoice, so on and so forth. And then there's also your settled deals. So you'll actually see that they've been settled and when they actually settled as well. Um, now the other thing too is the actual uh, asset finance team is growing. So when I took on the role, uh, there was only myself. Um, we've now got a team of four, so I've, I've been uh, lucky enough to be able to employ an admin associate by the name of Esther. And I've also got two BDMs, which is Stephen Light and Philip Meehan. So Stephen Light looks after Victoria, SA and WA. And then I've got Philip Meehan, who's based in Sydney, who looks after Sydney and Queensland. Um, they're there to help you guys with your scenarios and things that you're not sure about. Now Bolt will do most of that, okay, so if it's just a straightforward car and it might be a used car, whatever it is, the Bolt system has the smarts to do most of that for you. But if it's something that you're not sure about, it's a little bit out of the box, you can ring our 1300 number, which is on the bottom there, so 1300 24 88 78, dial option 1, and that'll take you through to either Steve or Phil, based on where you are based as a broker. So let's have a look at some of the lenders on panel. Um, if we have a look here, we've got uh, a number of different lenders. Now, the thing to bear in mind is, and you might be used to this in the home loan space, is obviously all the lenders that you deal with will offer some form of home loan lending, okay, or mortgage. In the asset space, we've got two different types of asset lending. We've got commercial and we've got consumer, okay? Now, unfortunately, in the third party space, a lot of lenders get a little bit gun shy around the consumer space when it comes to asset finance. So we don't have a huge array of lenders in that space. So if we look at consumer, we've got ANZ, we've got First Mac, we've got Macquarie, we've got Latitude, Pepper, Yamaha, and Rate Setter. That's it. All right, so we don't have a huge number of lenders that do the consumer side of stuff. If you were a consumer and you walked into a Commonwealth Bank branch and wanted to do a car loan, Commonwealth will do it, but it's a personal loan, 
All right? It's actually not a car or specific asset finance loan. So just bear that in mind. Uh, as far as commercial goes, they'll all do commercial lending in some way, shape or form. Okay? So ANZ is very popular in the market. They've got probably one of the sharpest rates going around. Um, they do consumer and commercial. Their low doc policy is quite popular. The uh, ABN has to be registered for 12 months if it's a commercial low doc. So the ABN has to be registered and trading for GST for a minimum of 12 months. Should be a property owner and the client can borrow up to 75 grand with no financials. Okay, on a car loan. Yes? Um, you know, you mentioned uh, someone can go into CBA and get a loan, but yep. if the person's not an asset finance loan, as far as the consumer's concerned, is there a difference? Yes. So the question was if somebody did go into a CBA branch and uh, do a car loan, which is actually a personal loan, is there a difference? Absolutely there is. Uh, basically the rates are higher for a start off. All right, personal loan is, is usually unsecured. They'll tell you that's secured by the car and make it cheaper, but it's still not going to be as competitive as any of these ones here that actually concentrate on the asset finance in the consumer space. Uh, the other part too, and this is a problem we've come across in the past where people try to get out of that loan uh, and refinance it because it is higher than what they could have gotten. Uh, it's actually unsecured. So CBA don't put a caveat over the car like everyone else does. So there's no, there's no notification that we've actually got money owing against that vehicle. Uh, and that causes problems as well because the lenders want to see a payout letter with interest owing on the vehicle. And of course there isn't, so that does cause problems as well. Um, so then moving on from ANZ, we've got BOQ. BOQ are really good in the yellow good space, trucks and trailers. They like a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, capital Finance, we do, we do a lot of business with Capital Finance. They're really good in the commercial cars, trucks, trailers as well, small equipment uh, and machinery. Uh, NAB, NAB are a, a bit more selective than some of the others. They really don't want anything less than 50 grand. Okay, so if you're doing a quote in Bolt and it's under $50,000, NAB is not going to show up. Right? Again, the system's got the smarts to understand what the lenders want and don't want. So if you do a, a, a deal in Bolt or a quote for 45 grand, NAB's not going to come up. If you do it for 60 or 70 or 80, NAB will show up. Okay? Uh, again, their, their appetite is that bigger ticket item. All right? They're not looking for the, the typical cars and all that sort of stuff. They're, their pricing is structured in such a way that they do want those cranes, uh, big trucks, machinery, that sort of stuff. Uh, First Mac is really, really new to the panel. In fact, they've only been on board for about three months. Uh, again, do consumer and commercial. Uh, quite interesting. They're, they're a little bit, little bit unique. Uh, they don't have a huge different arrays of, um, I suppose, rate structures and things like that. They will do a low dock commercial facility for someone with, who isn't asset backed. Okay? Typically, all the others, if you're going to do a low dock commercial facility, you have to be asset backed. First Mac will actually do it, provided the ABN is registered and trading for GST for more than three years. All right, so it has to be more than three years, and they'll actually do a low dock without being asset backed. So it's actually quite a unique, unique offering. Uh, CBA also, also in there. Um, obviously, they do cars, trucks, trailers, and so on and so forth. Prosper, I'll come back to Westpac. Uh, very popular in this space as well. Um, again, we do a lot of cars, we do a lot of trucks, a lot of trailers, a lot of machinery. Uh, I've even had guys do uh, brewing equipment. I had, a, I had a broker of ours do $1.1 million worth of brewing equipment with Westpac, so they're good on that stuff. Uh, Macquarie Leasing, also very popular. Um, again, consumer and commercial cars. Um, we probably do more, more consumer cars and commercial cars through Macquarie than some of the others. In saying that, if you go direct, because you can go direct to Macquarie, you'll find that the rates through Bolt are actually cheaper than if you go direct. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Um, they're about 1.2% cheaper if you, go through, if you go through Bolt. So we do get special rates that are available only through that Bolt channel that is av available to you guys. That's right, the, you're talking about the um, car buying service? Yes. Yes, so Macquarie do have the uh, vehicle select, which is a car buying service as well, yep. Something we're actually going to integrate into Bolt uh, in, the, in the not too distant future. Uh, Latitude, as you probably have seen the uh, ads on the TV with Alec Baldwin, the, uh, the betterers. Um, they're relatively new to us insofar as the motor and equipment, uh, or motor space anyway. Um, they're a little bit tricky. They've got diff various different uh, grades in, in the way that they classify the client based on their credit, their asset backing, their job employment and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but they're really good. They'll actually go to 20 years at end of term on a motor vehicle. Okay? So if we look at ANZ or Capital or Westpac, they'll all go to 12 years at end of term 
Okay, so the vehicle age cannot be more than 12 years at the end of that term, whereas latitude will go to 20 years. So that's very good if you've got someone that's looking at that 2002 Toyota Land Cruiser that holds its value, obviously doesn't break down, and somebody does actually want to buy it, that's really where you need to go is that latitude lender. Okay. Uh, Pepper, really good in this space too. They'll do boats, they'll do caravans, they'll do bikes, uh, cars, commercial equipment. They do pretty much everything. They'll even do solar as well uh, in the commercial space, not consumer. Um, Pepper are really good. Again, we've got a dispensation on the rate in there as well. So we get half a percent off through Bolt. So the base rate for, uh, for commercial is 5.49. The, um, the other good thing too is that Pepper will go to 15 years at end of term. So they're, they're sort of in between the mainstream ones and your latitude for the age of the vehicle. So they'll go to 15 years at end of term. Yamaha really good as well. They obviously, from the name, they do uh, bikes, jet skis, small personal watercraft. They'll even do bulk golf buggies. If you want to do a golf buggy, they'll do them. Um, their minimum lend is 1500 and they'll do uh, up to a five year term. Metro is a, is a unique commercial offering and the reason why it's unique is that I can't walk into a, a Metro branch. All right? I can't go and apply directly to Metro and get a, a loan. It has to go through third party. So they are a third party only operator. Uh, commercial lending only, so they'll do cars, trucks, equipment, anything that's wheeled. Um, the good thing about Metro too is that their new car rates will stick for up to five years of age. So if I did a new car, sorry, a used car with ANZ and it was three years old, the rate jumps significantly because of that age difference. Whereas if I do it with Metro, they stick to that new car rate for up to five years of age. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, again, through Bolt, we get 0.25 off as a, as a dispensation through there as well. So it's 25 basis points cheaper by going through the Bolt system. Uh, St George, very similar to Westpac, seeing as Westpac actually owns St George and Capital, but um, again, it's always only in that commercial space. Uh, rate setter, who's heard of Rate Setter? Yeah, a few of you. All right, Rate Setter are more of a personal loans provider. All right, it's not something you'll do through Bolt. Bolt is purely for the asset piece. Um, so if you do want to get accredited with Rate Setter, just uh, let Steve or, or your local BDM know. Very straightforward. Um, they're really, really sharp on the personal loan stuff. Um, in fact, obviously Latitude do personal loans as well, which we do a lot, a lot of business through there too. But I would suggest you should look at Rate Setter as well. They're, they're sharper on the rate, get good commission structure. Um, they're helpful to the client. They're also looking at, uh, they also do green energy for consumer. All right, no one else does. So if you've got somebody that wants to put solar panels on their home, you don't have to refinance their entire home. That's up to you guys. Uh, to, to do the solar panels. Rate Setter will actually do it as a secured lend, as a green product. All right? And I think their rates start around about sort of, sort of high sixes for memory. So again, cheap for what it is. All right? It's not really something you can go take off somebody's house and resell it. It's uh, pretty much attached. All right? uh, rate Setter are talking to us in doing a car product, but that's probably still a few months away. But that's something we'll integrate once we know more detail on that. So like I said, Rate Setter is really good. Who here has heard of Prosper? Yep. Prosper does unsecured lending to small to medium enterprise lenders. Uh, enterprise business, sorry, not lenders. Uh, so we've got Prosper. Now the one that's missing off that, which we've only just put on board, is SpotCap. And SpotCap do the same thing. Um, so basically they'll do, it's a solution based lend, okay? If you've got someone who's got tax debt, are they going to get finance anywhere? No. These guys will finance the tax debt, remove the tax debt off the book, okay? They can go out and get money to buy the equipment to generate more business for the, for the, for the company they were operating for. Um, so that's where that's, like I said, solution-based lend. It's not going to be cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a solution, okay? Uh, I can tell you Prosper works on a factoring, so anywhere between 1.15 to 1.4 the amount. So if I borrowed 10 grand, as an example, uh, I'd be paying back anywhere up to $14,000. I'm talking about how much. Oh, 200, 200, 250 grand, yeah. Yeah, they'll go high. Mm. Uh, it just depends on the strength of the applicant, obviously. Yeah. Yep. Uh, turnaround times is usually 48 hours too. So the client would actually have the money in their account in, within about 48 hours for the right client. So it's very, very quick. Um, so yeah, like I said, solution-based lending. So that's available to you as well. Any questions on that? Yep. Yeah, just to, um, on the asset plan, we, we were talking consumer and commercial. Are you talking the security or the, the borrower type? Or the, the purpose of the asset. The purpose of the asset. Yep. 
So consumer would be mums and dads, PAYG, um, yeah, just need a family car. Uh, commercial could be plumber, chippy, uh, need a ute for work. Uh, could also be salesperson, right? They're PAYG, but they use their car predominantly for business use. That can also be captured under the commercial piece. Right, so it depends on what it's for. So let's have a look at the market. Um, and this is where it gets, this is quite an interesting piece. So it's un interesting to understand that in Australia, we sold over 1.1 million new cars last year. Now that's just new cars. That's not including used cars and it's certainly not including private sales. All right, so this is just new cars because we can finance all of those things, but we're just going to focus on the new car section for a sec. Now, we've done that for the last three years. All right? We've done over 1.1 million new cars. In fact, this year it's trending to look like we might even hit the 1.2 million mark if we continue on the same sort of trend. So we are increasing the number of new cars being bought. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to why that might be? Yeah, no, it's, he's, he's reading ahead. Very good. Um, people are changing their vehicles over more regularly. All right? Typically, most people would finance a car over a five-year term, but they'll get out of it somewhere between that three to four-year mark. All right? So we're seeing that happen. Cars are also more affordable insofar as you get more bang for your buck. I mean, you think about today, you spend 35 grand on a car today, what would that have got you five to ten years ago? You get a lot more equipment in the car than you do back then. So that's what's driving that. Plus the other factor is interest rates are an all time low on this stuff. All right? So again, it's becoming that sort of cheap money. A lot more people go, well, look, I can actually afford to change it over and jump, jump in more regularly. Um, now average loan size, you've, you probably see on the screen there, I've got the average loan size is 40 grand. Um, I've been doing this for three and a half years. Every single month I cut the numbers and every single time it works out about the same. It's somewhere between 39 to 41 and a half grand. That's where it sits every month. Don't ask me how, just does. Um, what's the average loan size for you guys in the uh, home loan space, you think? 500. Yeah, about 400. Four to 500, Four to thereabouts. Now, obviously, if you're doing a mortgage, it's usually a consumer, obviously, so you have to do all your NCCP documentation, you have to do your fact fine and all that sort of stuff, yeah? How long, on average, would you spend talking to a client to do that home loan if you've got to do all that compliance documentation as well. So this is from the moment you have that first conversation, convincing them to do the actual finance with you, doing your NCCP documentation, chasing it through to approval, chasing it through to settlement, and actually waiting for it to all get done and dusted. How much of your actual time would you spend on average? Would it be 10 hours? Minimum. Minimum 10 hours? Minimum. Minimum 10 hours, okay. Definitely more than two hours, yes. <laughs> all right, so let's say it's 10 hours, and this is only because I'm stupid and need to be able to work out the maths easily. Uh, so what would be the average commission you'd make on a, uh, call it 500 grand home loan? Four. About four grand? Three, four, somewhere around there. Okay. When do you get paid? When it settles? No, yeah. After. after it settles, that's right. So that's right. All right. So it could be from the time that you start talking to that client, it could be anywhere up to four months before you actually see money in your account depending on whether it's a refi, depending on whether it's a purchase, all sorts of variables, yeah? The average time that you should spend in this space to do a car loan is about two hours of your actual time, all right? Sometimes less, sometimes more if you've not done it before, <coughs> but average amount of time that you should spend doing it is about two hours. That includes the NCCP as well, all right? Because obviously there's that, that's attached to any consumer lending, so that's there as well. Um, the commission that you make on it is obviously less than a home loan. But if you look at it comparatively, it's far greater in the, in the asset space than what it is in the home loan space. So on a $40,000 loan, I would expect that you should earn somewhere between one and a half to two percent of that amount financed as a commission. Okay, so I would say that if you're not making $1,000 on that transaction, there's something wrong. Okay, you should be making at least a thousand bucks on that transaction. Now you're saying for four grand, call it, on a, on a home loan commission of 500 grand, that's taking you a minimum of 10 hours of work and you might get paid in four months thereabouts, as opposed to a thousand bucks, it's taking you two hours and I get paid when? When it settles, right? We pay every Tuesday and every Thursday. So if we get the funds from the lender before either of those two days, you get paid on that Tuesday or Thursday. 
All right, we don't hold onto it, we just forward it straight through. Now some lenders do actually pay tardy, if you want to call it that. So Macquarie Consumer, as an example, they don't pay us until the beginning of the following month. All right, I can't do anything about that. The commercial stuff gets paid straight away, but the consumer stuff gets paid the following month. Uh, ANZ pay pretty much the same next day. We'll get the funds the next day. Okay, so there is there is differences between the lenders, but essentially understand that you will get paid as soon as we get the funds. Okay. So let's look at where all the asset finance actually gets written in Australia, how that's actually broken up. So if we look at this, we can see that trucks and buses make up 16% of the asset finance that gets written. Uh, manufacturing is 4%, agri is 6 Mining, earth moving, construction makes up about 13%. Okay. Now that might actually reduce because obviously the mining sector is slowing down um, until they find some new vein of something. I'm sure they'll pick up again. Uh, but the thing we want to concentrate on here is the cars and the light commercial side of it. Who here owns a car? Most people own a car. How many people have financed that car? A lot of people have financed that car. All right? Typically it's about 50% of the people in the room when I do this have financed the car. Why wouldn't we want to tap into that? All right? It makes up nearly 40% of all the asset finance that gets written in Australia. It's the easiest part of the parcel to take hold of. All right? How many of you are actually talking about asset finance to your clients when you're doing their home loans? Got one? It's usually a resounding no, so I'm impressed that you actually are. That's fantastic. If you're going through their assets and liabilities, wouldn't you notice that there's a car payment in their liabilities? Would it not sound a reason that you could talk to them about the car finance at that point in time and tell them that you can help them the next time they do it? Maybe even ask if you can get a copy of their contract that they signed so you can actually go through it and say, oh, look, yep, no, I could have definitely helped you out. Because nine times out of ten you'll find that you can actually do better than what they've had at a dealer. So we'll touch on some of the facilities that are available to you. All right, so we've got consumer product, consumer loan. Pretty straightforward. Uh, it works very similarly to the way a home loan does. So I'll get you to take one of those and pass around. For those watching at home, we will have these available for download um, after today's session. So the consumer loan is, as I said, very similar to a home loan. There's a principal and interest component. They borrow the money, the financier provides them the money. It's secured against that vehicle. Uh, they pay the interest and the principal down. At the end of the term, they make their last payment. The vehicle's theirs, all right? The financier takes off their interest of that vehicle. Um, nothing tricky. It is what it is. We then move on to the commercial product. Now, the commercial product are these three here. Now, I'm sorry, I should mention the NCCP definitely does apply to any consumer loan, all right? So whether that be a personal loan, car loan, home loan, anything that's consumer, NCCP does apply. You'll be surprised how many times I get, oh, I didn't think NCCP applied to cars. No, it does, all right? It's consumer lending, it definitely does. All right, so your commercial products are channel mortgages, commercial high purchases, leases and novated leases, right? They're a commercial product. So they are unregulated, right? ASIC do not get involved in those products yet. <laughs> Give it time. All right, but at this stage they are unregulated. So which do you think is more popular with mortgage brokers? Unregulated. Unregulated, of course it is. <laughs> All right. Now, of the three products that we see here, the one that you are going to do 99% of the time is actually a chattel mortgage. All right. I'll get you to take one and pass around. Now, the reason why you would do a chattel mortgage is because of a number of factors. Now, I'm not going to tell you this so you can advise your clients. This is purely so you understand why people would go for a chattel mortgage. A channel mortgage becomes an asset of my business. All right, so if I've, got a, if I've got a company and I'm buying a car and I do it as a channel mortgage, I own the vehicle, it goes on my books as my asset to depreciate. If I do a commercial hire purchase or a novated lease, who owns the vehicle? Finance. Finance company does, okay? So I don't get to claim the depreciation of that asset because it's not my asset to claim. All right, if it's a channel mortgage, I can also claim the GST up to the luxury car tax threshold. So if I've bought a car for 45 grand, in my next quarterly BAS, I can claim back $4,145 or whatever it is in my next quarterly BAS straight away, okay? If I've done it as a CHP or a lease, I can't, especially if it's a lease. Who do you think claims back the GST if it's a lease? Finance company, yeah, they do. Um, which is why I pay GST on all my repayments on a lease and I can claim back that little bit of GST on every single payment. So. A lot of accounts will advise a channel mortgage because I get to claim it back in one lump sum and move on with my life. The other part to it as well is that with a channel mortgage, I've got more flexibility. I can do 100% lend 
I can do 90% lend, I can do 80% lend. I don't have to borrow the full amount. I can also change the balloon. So if I wanted to, I could borrow 100% over five years with zero owing at the end. I cannot do that with a lease at all. All right, taxation rules state that I have to do 100% lend for a start off and I have to have a minimum amount as a balloon. So if it's a five year term, I cannot have anything less than a 27.5% balloon on a lease. All right, ATO dictates that. Whereas over here, I can. All right? That's why I say it's more flexible. Um, plus, obviously, if I pay it out, there's no GST owing on it, whereas on that one there is. So there's a number of reasons why you would choose a chattel mortgage over a lease if it's a business. Again, like I said, I'm not telling you this so you can educate your clients, just helping you understand why accountants will tell their clients to do chattel mortgages. Any questions on that? So what is the mortgage broker difference? I think the key thing you need to understand is stop thinking about yourselves as mortgage brokers. All right, start thinking of yourselves as finance brokers. All right, you don't just do mortgages. And this is a problem. This is a perception that the market has of mortgage brokers is that that's all you guys do. All right, home loans. I'll go to you for a home loan. As soon as it comes to car finance, who do I go to? Well, yeah, dealers are nine, nine times out of 10. Or they go direct to bank or they search for someone else who actually specialises in that. All right? You guys can actually do all of it, and that's what you need to do, is educate your clients to understand that you do do all of it. All right? They need to think of you when you're doing their home loan, car finance, equipment finance, uh, insurance, whatever it might be. You want to be a finance broker. So you need to educate your clients that perhaps the dealer options might not be the best one for you, uh, or for them, I should say. Uh, try and get some referral partners if you can. Accounts and financial planners are always good. I don't recommend trying to hook up with a car dealership for obvious reason, because they'll give you the worst of the worst, um, because otherwise they'll do it themselves, obviously. All right. Um, some people suggest that you could uh, put it up on your LinkedIn profile if you've got a LinkedIn profile or even your Facebook profile, uh, just letting people know. But the key thing is, is we've got marketing templates within Mercury that allow you to target your database on a regular basis to talk about asset finance. You need to keep front of mind, all right? Buying a car or a piece of equipment is usually more emotional than buying a house, all right? A house is a more calculated piece that you would actually go out and finance. You don't just drive past a house one day and go, oh, it's up for sale, I might buy that, all right? Whereas on a car, they do, all right? They'll see an ad on the TV for a new car that gets released. They'll be driving past the dealership two weeks later and they'll say, oh, remember that car I saw on TV? I might just pop in and have a look. Next minute, they're test driving the car. Next minute, their car's being valued. Next minute, they're buying it. All right, it happens like that. So you need to make sure that you are kept front of mind and be in front of your clients as much as you can to let them know that you do asset finance. Very fundamental point. Only 25% of the mortgage brokers in Australia did an asset finance deal last year. That's low as far as I'm concerned. That should be closer to 50 or 60% at least. All right, we need to be better at this. And I'm gonna show you later on why you should be doing asset finance and how it's going to help your clients. So think about this for a moment. If you've done um, some marketing to your clients and they've gone out and bought a car, right? so let's say they've gone out, bought the car, rung you up and they've said, hey, uh, I just bought a car on the weekend, can you help me out with the finance? What are you going to say? Absolutely. Good answer, absolutely. All right, yes, absolutely yes. All right, if you say maybe, I think I can, can I get back to you? You've lost, all right? Regardless of whether you think you can or can't, you've just lost that deal. Why? Because they've just come from a dealership that said what? Yes, okay? So you need to say yes. Regardless of whether you've written one before or not, just say yes, all right? That's what Steve and I and, and Phil are here to do. We're here to help you, all right? And Bolt will do most of that for you as well. Second question you're gonna get asked once you've said yes, what do you think that's gonna be? What's the best rate you can do? All right. If you get into a rate conversation with this client, guess what? You lose. Why? Because they've just come from a dealership that does what? 1% finance. They lie. I don't do, some do 1% finance, but we'll talk about that later as well. But they lie. Essentially, they lie. So how do, we get, how do we get somebody to not think about rate? How do we win this deal? It's all about repayments. All right, we've got to switch their mindset from rate to repayments. Now, look, I don't hold it against them that they want to talk about rate. That's fine. We've all been educated to do that. 
All right, it's been passed on by generation to generation that you have to make sure you get the best rate, get the best rate, get the best rate. You don't repay rate, you pay back payments. All right, if I told you that your monthly repayment was $15,000 a month, but your rate was 1%, if you can't afford $15,000 a month, don't you think the rates are relevant? All right, so it always comes back to the actual repayment. So how do we get from switching from rate to repayment? Very simple. First thing you need to understand is, I've not yet come across anyone who's excited about paying for a car. They're excited about buying the car, but they're not excited about paying for it. So get them excited about the car again, right? They've made the effort to contact you, to ring about you, talk to you about the finance side of it. This is not an easy conversation for them. You've got to make it easy for them. So if it's easy, you start saying to them, great, what car did you buy? Oh, I bought the new Mazda, blah, 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 blah. Oh, fantastic. That's awesome. I saw that on the TV just recently. That looks like a fantastic car. What colour did you get? Oh, I got the red. Oh, fantastic. Well, the red does go faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. What options did you get on it? So you get them excited about the car again. Then you start asking them questions like, how long do you want to keep it for? Oh, five years. Fantastic. Is it going to be a new business name or a personal name? Are you going to have a balloon on it? Is there, a, is there a budget that you're trying to stick to? Is there a, an amount per month that you're happy to stick to? Now, I've asked this question, what are they thinking about now? Are they thinking about rate or are they thinking about how much they can afford? All right, psychologically this works, guys. You're switching the mindset away from rate to now thinking about how much does it cost me out of my back pocket every month to pay for this car? Now, whether that be weekly, fortnightly or monthly, it doesn't matter. Dealers will talk weekly, why? Cheaper, absolutely. Again, psychological trick. All right, if I tell you your car's gonna cost you $650 a month, or it's only gonna cost you $112 a week, whatever, right, whatever it might be, then that's what they're gonna go with. They're gonna go with the one that sounds more palatable, okay? So we need to stop talking about rate and start talking about repayments. So what I've given you there is a list of questions and I don't expect you to use them verbatim, but they are some questions that you can use to slow that process down and get them thinking about repayment as opposed to rate. All right, have a look at them, put it in your own words. I'm not saying you have to use those words, but put it in your own words. It's still got to come from you, but this is just to give you a framework of some of the things you should be asking to slow that process right down, okay? So how do we beat car yards? Look, it's hard, all right, and I can tell you from experience, car yards lie, all right? I was one of them, I know exactly how they work. But what we need to understand is typically car dealers or yards have one lender available to them, all right? So when I was in the trade, I had one lender available to me and that was it. I didn't have a, a panel of lenders like what you guys have, all right? So I didn't have all these options. Sometimes you might find that a dealership has two types of franchise attached to it. So it might be a Hyundai dealership attached with a Nissan dealership or a Ford dealership, whatever it might be. And they might have two different streams of finance, but typically they're limited to one. So you use that to your advantage. You've got a whole panel that you can look at as opposed to that one option. The other thing to understand too is they're not governed by NCCP yet. All right, it's September next year they should be, but at this stage they aren't. Now, how many of your clients do you think know what NCCP actually is? I'd, I'd hazard to say zero. Okay, so talk to them about it. Help them understand what it is. All right? They don't know what ASIC is. They don't know that ASIC is breathing down each and every one of our necks to make sure that we're providing the best possible solution to our client and that we're not going to put them in financial hardship at the end of it. Do you think a dealer cares? I can tell you now, a lot of the bankruptcies that happen are because people have bought cars through dealers that shouldn't have bought cars. All right? Typically, finance brokers don't sell cars. Does anyone here sell cars? No. So keep it that way. Educate your clients. Think about how much experience you guys have got in the finance industry versus the car yard. How much finance experience do you think a car industry dealership has? A person in the car yard. Do you think they've gone out and got surf force? Do you think they've gone and got their diplomas? Do you think they're parts of MFAA or FBAA or industry bodies? Do you think they go out and get CIO and PI and all that sort of stuff? Do you think they go to professional development days to make sure they're keeping abreast of what's happening in the industry? No. I can tell you from experience, I, um, so I was selling cars for about seven years before I'd had enough. 
and the dealership that I was operating out of had gone through four business managers in the space of six months. All right, it became a revol revolving door. Um, I put my hand up for the role. I said, look, I, I want to try something different. I'll have a crack. They said no. I said yes. They said no. I won. And then uh, I did a training course with Toyota Finance. I was at a Lexus dealership, so I did Toyota fi Finance. How long do you think my training course went for? Day, half a day, not far off, all right? The day started at nine, I had a morning tea break, I had an hour for lunch, an afternoon tea break, and I was done by four o'clock in the afternoon. All right, and straight out, go sell some finance. Did I have experience in finance before? Nope, none whatsoever. Was I a financial wizard? Right, that dealership went from being one of the lowest performing dealerships for Lexus in a, in a finance perspective to one of the highest. Right, I put that dealership through its first one million, two million, and three dollar, three million dollar month. Right, just me on my own. Was that because I was a financial guru? No, no, I'm the salesperson. That's all it was. It was because I sat there and smiled. Right? I'm a smiling assassin and that's what you're dealing with. Right? You're not dealing with a financial wizard, you are dealing with someone who just knows how to sell. Right? And they will sell their own grandmother if that's what it takes. They're not interested in looking after the client or making a friend. You guys are. Well, maybe not the friend part, but you don't want them to go away and take their business elsewhere. You want them to continue to use you, refer other people to you. Right? Come back to you when they want to refinance their home or their investment property or their car or whatever else that they want to do. Car yards don't do that, they don't care, all right? It's a numbers game, so you need to understand that. Try and keep the deal at arm's length, all right? Educate your client. I'll do the finance, because that's what I'm good at. That's what I've got years of training in. They don't, they're very good at selling the car. Let them sell the car. Or as this gentleman pointed out before, use a car buying service. Macquarie have one available to you. That keeps them out of the dealership altogether, all right? That's where you really want to get to. So there are options available to you, but you would need to educate your client to keep them away from that scenario. Does that make sense? So we'll have a look at some of the stuff that happens in, this, uh, in, this, um, in the dealerships. Now, unfortunately, there is one thing that car yards will always have over you that you cannot combat. Has anyone got any idea what that is? Delivery. Sorry? Immediate delivery. Immediate delivery. Mm, that's not the biggest one. That's something. That's not the, that's not, not the biggest one. Think about it. It's the big shiny thing with four wheels under it. They're selling the car. All right, there's an emotional tie-in to that. I want that car. All right, you don't have the car. You're not selling the car. You haven't got the captive audience. The dealership does, and they know this. All right, so I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's say we go into a dealership on a Saturday afternoon to buy a car. Why? Because that's when we've got time to go out and do this. We all work busy lives. We all have Monday to Friday. That's when we're working. So we go in that Saturday afternoon to buy a car. Sit down with the sales guy, we agree to the sale price of the car, he wheels us into the finance office, right? The finance guy sits there and he'll start talking to us about numbers. We come to an agreement that we're happy with the monthly repayment of $700 a month, as an example. All right, so the car we've traded in, which we are now driving home in, is now a piece of crap in our mind because we've got a new one coming. Yeah, all right? It doesn't matter how long or how new that car is, you have now just bought something new and you don't want the car you've got, you want the new one. So you Facebook and Twitter everybody to tell them you've just bought a new car and you drive home, you work for the next three days because you're going to pick your car up on Thursday. So come Thursday, you get out, get to the dealership, you slam the car door in disgust because now you really hate the car and you walk into the dealership. Who's bought a new car before? A few of you? This is, this is something you'll notice and you may not notice it then but you'll notice it now. If you buy a new car, you look at how many people are excited for you that isn't just the salesperson. The receptionist will be excited for you, the finance guy will be excited for you, the sales guy is definitely excited because he's getting paid, right? but there's other people, the detailer would even be excited. Okay, you'll walk in, they'll go, oh, I saw your car on the showroom floor, it looks fantastic, I bet you can't wait to get in it. And you're like, oh yes, I can't wait. They go, oh look, just go into the finance guy, he'll sort you out, we'll get, it, we'll get you to it as quick as you can. You walk into the finance guy's office, he goes, oh yeah, I saw the car on the showroom floor, it looks awesome, mate. I can't wait, bet you can't wait to get in it. And you're like, yes, can you hurry up? So you sit down, he goes through the bits and pieces, he goes, oh, unfortunately we do have to go through the paperwork, but you know, we'll get through as clear as we can for you. Now your repayments are $730 a month, and you go, oh, hang on. On Saturday you told me they were $700 a month. 
Oh yeah, no, look what's actually happened is, it's gone through our credit team, it's been reassessed, and unfortunately it has gone up a little bit, so now it's $730 a month. Yeah, well that's all well and good, but I've budgeted 700, not 730. Yeah, no, look, I appreciate that, and I actually got on the phone to the credit team, and I said, look, this is ridiculous. I've quoted this guy 700 bucks a month, and now you're telling me it's 730, I can't, I can't go back with that. Well, unfortunately, I got told I'm not the one lending the money, so it is what it is. But you know what, I know it's 30 bucks a month, but it is only $30 a month. It's like $7 a week. A couple of cups of coffee a week. And you know what? Your car's there. It's ready to go. How many people signed that contract? Every single one of them. Right? Every single one of them. Why? Because I've belittled you to say that it's only $30 a month. I've dropped it down to $7 a week. I've now put, a, I've put something tangible to it, a couple of cups of coffee. Right? And I've then told you, but your car's there ready to go. Do you want to get back in your piece of crap car? That's really what I'm saying. And you're going, no, I don't. Now, how long before you forget about that extra $30 a month? As soon as I start the car. <laughs> yeah. As soon as your hand touches the steering wheel, zzzk, gone. Forgotten. All right? And off you go into the sunset paying that extra $30 a month. Will you come back in four years' time and do it again? Yep, right? Because that's what happens. People forget. Now that extra $30 a month that I've just charged you extra, how much do you think that's made the dealership? Close to, close to 1700 but thereabouts. 15 to 1700 So for the sake of a 20 minute argy-bargy conversation, knowing that you're going to forget about it within seconds of getting into your car, I'm 15 to $1,700 richer. How good's that? Absolutely, that's it. All right, that's on top of whatever commission I'd already built into it. That's just shits and giggles. All right, they do this all the time, guys. Why do you think they can do it? Because they've got a captive audience. Where are you going to go? Are you going to go home and tell everybody why you didn't pick up your new car? No. Are you going to tell everybody that you wouldn't pay an extra $7 a week to get your car there and then? No. All right, it doesn't happen. So they know this happens, so they use it to their advantage. So you need to tell your client beforehand, or at least get them approved beforehand, so they don't talk to the finance guy. They're not concentrating on documentation when they're there to pick up the car, all right? And I'll give you a perfect example, and I used to do this all the time. So we, when I was at Lexus, we had a, like a cafe thing at the front, which we all had to be barista trained. So they'd wander in, so I'd meet and greet them, go, oh, hey, how are you going? Yeah, car's ready there, looking fantastic, awesome. Do you want a cappuccino? Yep, no worries. I'll make the cappuccino and the latte and all that sort of stuff. And I'd say, stand there in front of them and I'd say, look, I know you're in a hurry. And they'd be going, <laughs> right? So then I'd say, look, I've actually pre-printed everything for you. It's ready to go. And I'd have little sign here tabs. And I'd say, okay, so all I need you to do is sign here, sign here, sign here. Fantastic. That's all done for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Now you can get to the fun stuff, get in your car. Here's your copy of the contract. Thanks very much. Did they read it? Will they read it? Do they know what they've just signed? Absolutely not. And you know what the best part is? Buyer beware. Not my problem. I didn't say that you couldn't look at it. I didn't say you couldn't read it. You told me you were in a hurry. All bets are off. All right? You're now locked into that for the next three or four years or whatever it is, five years. Okay? So bear that in mind. That happens all the time. They're distracted by the car, they're not focused on the paperwork. Some of the stuff that they might say is that uh, there was a, a rate increase because it didn't meet the, repay the, the uh, credit file. When we did the quote, it didn't include the optional extras. All right, sorry, I thought you were paying cash for that tow bar. Uh, it was a typo, fat fingers that day, whatever it might be. Happens all the time, guys. Now I'm gonna show you, sorry. I'm gonna show you a contract that was done through a dealership. All right, this is not uncommon to see these things. Unfortunately, I don't get them all that often because uh, not too many people like to come and tell me they've just been shafted by a dealership. Not many people like to put their hand up to admit that for obvious reason. All right, so this is a sander, which is ANZ. So ANZ at the top there. For obvious reasons, I've blanked out names and numbers and whatnot. But this contract was done in Oct oh, sorry, August of 2014, so it's three years ago. All right. I can tell you the base rate on that product at that time was 
That was the base, product, base rate on that product. Okay? Now, this contract, hopefully everyone can see that, was written at 13.22%. Do you think that's a good deal for the dealer or the client? Dealer, dealer. yeah, very good. Now, I also know from this that it is a consumer contract, not a commercial contract. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to why I know that this is a consumer contract and not a commercial contract? Name? No? There's no name on there? I'm talking about what I can physically see right now, not what I've already whited out. Sort of breakdown of the fees and terms? Or? No. It's got a bright red ring around it. The rate. The rate, yeah. But a consumer can go up to 29%. Yeah, but it's actually displayed on the contract for a consumer contract. If it's a commercial contract, there is no rate displayed on the contract. All right, there's no legal obligation for me to do that. So on a consumer contract, it is actually displayed. That's the first part. Now, this particular client has financed $82,044. Can we see that? They're also going to pay back just under 44 grand in interest over that term. So they're paying back more than half of the car in interest. Why? Well, that's obviously part one is the rate. The second part is it's on a seven year term. Not something I recommend, all right, but it's a seven year term. 182 fortnightly repayments is seven years. Uh, in fact, ANZ is stopping that as of this month. They won't do seven year terms anymore. That's how much I don't recommend it. All right, ANZ have actually realized it's probably not the best thing. I think Pepper will still go to seven years, but, but uh, yeah, these guys won't do it anymore. Anyway, so the client will pay back over the term $126,000 for that vehicle. Now, which way do cars go in value? Yeah, down. down, at a rapid rate of knots. Right? This is not bricks and mortar, this is a motor vehicle that goes down. Now, in saying that, this client, if that car at the term, uh, sorry, is 82 grand, I reckon at the end of that seven year term, that car would be lucky if it's worth 10 grand at the end of that. So to have a 10 grand asset to have paid 126 grand for it, who's winning? Correct, the dealership. Now, do you think it gets much worse than that? Can it get much worse than that, do you think? Oh, yes. That's a loaded question, of course it does. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't ask it. <laughs> All right, page two reveals more of the contract, and it shows us that the vehicle price itself was $46,999. Yeah, what is right? How much did we find it? 82. 82. So how do we get from 47? To 82. It's a fair big gap. Yeah. So part one of that is negative equity. Who's here heard of negative equity? A few of you. For those that don't know what that is, it's a shortfall on my car. So if I've got a trade in and let's say I owe 25 grand on it, I've rolled into the dealership, the dealership's valued it, they've turned around and gone, Mr. Sternberg, your car's worth 10 grand. And I stand there and go, okay, I cop that. Where's the other 15 grand coming from? My back pocket. But the dealership's going to be really nice and they go, don't worry about that. It's fine. We'll add it to your existing finance contract. We'll just add it to that. So now we've got a situation where we're paying 13.22% on 16 and a half grand, which is what? Fresh air. I might as well get a personal loan. Right? So it's fresh air that. So they've added that on at 13.22%. So that's part one. Part two is that the dealership's been really kind to add on a consumer credit insurance policy. This is like uh, TPD insurance. It's the best way to describe it. That if I become disabled, unable to work, can't get an income, that insurance policy is going to cover the payments on the car. Just the car. But it's a $15,000 policy at 13.22% for seven years. So that gets added on. Now, I will tell you that this is probably the most expensive one I've ever seen. Typically, they tend to be around about the five to seven mark, but 15's, in my opinion, taking the piss. Then they've gone in and said, well, that's okay. We're just gonna add in a gap insurance policy as well. Does anyone know what gap is? It's actually a really good policy if it's sold correctly. So, take out the insurances 
All right, just take those top two numbers. If I finance the car with that negative equity, all right, I've taken my insurance, my normal motor vehicle insurance, I drive off the showroom floor, I get to the next intersection, some lunatic T-bones me, writes the car off, okay? <coughs> I'm okay, thank you for asking. But, car's not. How much is the insurance company gonna give me? They're gonna give me 47 grand. Where's the other 16 and a half grand coming from? Yours truly again, okay? What GAP does is it covers the shortfall in the event of a write-off. Right? It doesn't cover it if I come in to trade it in and there's this massive shortfall. Too bad, so sad. Then you pay some bikey to take your car and write it off. That covers a GAP in the event of a shortfall if it's written off. Okay. Now, there is a fundamental problem here. I know from experience that that cover does not cover $34,000 of shortfall. Why? Because we've got 16, 16 and a half, 15 plus the actual policy itself. So I'm, I'm already 34 grand behind the eight ball before I even start. So the price of the premium will determine how much it covers. So they usually go up in amounts of sort of five to 10 to 15 to 20 grand. That's usually how it works. And the premium goes up at each stage. Two and a half grand would cover around 15 to 20 grand of shortfall. All right, so I'm still gonna be out of pocket the other problem is that policy runs for five years. How long do we do this for? Seven. Seven. So day one after my five year anniversary, where am I? Back to square one. All right, the dealership then adds on what they call an origination fee of 770. Have you guys seen that before? You guys can do exactly the same thing, all right? I can tell you now, every single dealership out there will be charging the maximum they can on an origination fee. Every single one of them. Why? Because that's a given to them as commission. That is straight commission. It gets added to the amount borrowed and they know that they're walking away with a minimum of $770. Okay? And this is how we make our magical number of $82,000. Now, I'm gonna ask you a question. If you wrote an $82,000 home loan, how much commission would you make? And don't say stuff all, because that's what everyone says. What would it actually be? 500 bucks? Yeah. All right. How much do you reckon the dealership made out of this contract? Not the car, just the contract. Five grand. Five grand, anyone else? 10 to 15. 10 to 15, anyone else? Bearing in mind, you've just told me you'll make 500 bucks on a home loan, but you're quite happily to tell me that they'll make five to 15 grand on a on commission. Anyone else? Three. Three? So I put the seed of doubt in your head, didn't I? It's nineteen thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars. They walked away with twenty grand on that contract. Now the the problem is that the client did sign the documents without checking it, as always. They signed up for insurances that they didn't even know were in there, as always. Why? Because it always came down to a monthly payment. What can you afford? How much can you afford per fortnight? All right. The dealership will roll in as many things in there as they can to make as much commission as they can. You may not necessarily know about it. Thankfully, that client walked into one of our brokers over in uh, WA, that was done in WA, um, and uh, sat down with one of our mortgage brokers. Now at the time, NCCP wasn't as ugly as it is today. We were able to refinance it pretty much straight away. Um, we managed to get rid of the CCI insurance. So we got rid of that, got most of that back prorated, kept gap, obviously can't do anything about the shortfall. Even with the payout penalties, even with that, the rate to the client was about 9.9 .9 in the end. Uh, we got the term down to five years as opposed to seven years. But the biggest part of it is we saved the client 36 grand on the whole term of that loan. Now that broker did that for that client. Do you think that client's ever gonna go back to a dealership to finance a car or do you think they're just gonna go to that broker again? The broker. Uh, the broker, all right. So this is about helping you guys understand that you're there to help your clients. Yes, it's a money earner, absolutely. Yes, it's gonna make your clients stickier, but you know what, you're actually helping your clients because you're helping them from not getting done like this poor guy, okay? And it was from a very reputable dealership over there. So it's not necessarily the dealership's fault, but the person that's actually doing it, all right? And not all of that gets controlled like it does in, the, in our space. Does that make sense? Yeah? Uh, it's a point of sale exemption that was ruled in, or which was lobbied and ruled in back in 2010. 
Um, so Harvey Norman got it, Car Yards got it. It was supposed to be for 12 months, by the way. So six years later, we're still dealing with it. Could you say there's not the resources in Australia to train the 5,000 people at the rock face, especially with it up to speed? Well, we've done it with 15,000 odd mortgage brokers, so I don't understand. It's time, though, but at one time, one industry. Or yeah, I would argue that they could have easily done it. That's, I mean, you know, it's no different than ASIC saying that all the NCCP stuff had to come in for mortgage brokers. That didn't happen overnight. That took 12 months, roughly, to get it up to speed. They could have done exactly the same thing with the car yards. The insurance issues no longer as bad as it because ASIC. So Not as bad. It depends on the lender. So as an example, ANZ won't finance those products anymore, at all. They won't even entertain it. Uh, but there are some lenders that still do. Uh, and then it comes back down to the actual insurance itself. Again, they're still not being regulated, so they'll still get away with it where they can, uh, but they're a little bit more mindful of it. There was a big review around about six months ago. Yeah. yeah. It was finalised that Alfera... Um, oh, Alfera were done. Um, all of them had to pay out a lot of contracts that were just mm. like that because they missold, um, not disclosed, and yep. all the rest of Well, they'll still be selling it, and they'll, still be, they'll just be disclosing it now. But I just, and that's an example of yeah, the, absolutely. The, the, um, the way that those contracts were written as finally being uncovered and look what you've had to deal with and that's through the protection not being appropriate. Well, and you know, that's a good point. The, the fact that obviously ASIC have stepped in and, and looked at a lot of that sort of stuff. Perfect example would be Alfira. Um, so we don't have Alfira on panel anymore. We, we chose to leave them behind. Um, the reason being is that it's a little bit hard to justify why you should have a lender on panel that's just been... Uh, or had to outlay $77 million in compensation uh, for that exact reason. You know, putting, putting people into finance contracts that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, single mum with five kids uh, on Centrelink walk, driving around in a brand new BMW. You sort of go, well, how's that work? Um, because they fudged the figures to get it through because they wanted the sale, and it happened. So now she's probably very grateful because she's probably driving around in a free BMW because they've had to pay out those contracts. Uh, so yeah, there's a there's a whole heap of learning there for the for the motor vehicle industry. A friend of mine bought one the other day, a BMW, and uh, there was a person in the room transcripted the line rant. Oh right. Watching everything that was said, written and done. Yeah. Well, I think they've actually still got the auditors sitting in their credit team, still going through everything. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. That's something. That's a mistake you don't want. <laughs> you do not want to get on the bad side of, of, of ASIC at all. So let's have a look at some quoting tips. Um, now this is going to sound relatively obvious, but what you want to do is make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Okay? The reason why I say that is because I've had brokers come to me in the past uh, and said, well, our rates are too expensive. I said, okay, based on what? I mean, these are all the base rates from the lenders, based on what? Oh, well, I've, my client's been to the dealership and I'm so far away in pricing, I, it's got to be rate. So I said, well, give me the example. He goes, okay, well, the client's bought himself a $117,000 Porsche. It's on a five-year term, no balloon, and I'm $450 more expensive per month than what the dealership's quoted. I said, okay. So let's look at this logically. $450 a month is not rate. Unless you're trying to charge 30% interest, it's not going to happen. All right, interest rate, to give you an idea, if you charge an extra 1%, you would change the repayments on that contract somewhere around $25 to $26 a month. It doesn't make that big a difference, okay? I said to him, I said, okay, so it's a five-year term, $450 a month. That's 60 times 450. That's 30 grand. There's 30 grand missing. So either the client's putting in a trade-in that you don't know about, they're putting a 30 grand deposit in that you don't know about, or the dealership's quoted it with a balloon that your client doesn't seem to know about. Which one of those is the most likely? Balloon. Balloon. Spot on. All right. So again, make sure you're comparing apples to apples. All right. If it's a lease, you know, we talked about leases before where there's a GST component on it. If it's a lease, make sure the repayments include GST. All right. If your repayment inclusive of GST is 1100 as a dealer, I can tell you how I would deliver that to the client. All right. It'd be $1,000 plus GST. And they go, I'm sorry, come again? <laughs> you go, $1,000 plus GST. What number have they heard? Thousand. Thousand. Did I lie? Nope. No. Do they hear the plus GST? Yep. Nope. No, they don't. They just hear thousand dollars. So they come to you and go, oh, this is what I've been quoted. And you're sitting scratching your head going, oh, how do we get to a thousand dollars and make money and still be competitive? Okay. 
Uh, be wary of rate-based quotes. All right? This is when a dealership has quoted a client a number. All right? Let's say the repayments are $700 a month and they say to the client, yeah, but your interest rate is 3.9%. Do you think a client can actually work it out to correlate the payment and the rate? Nope. So what do you do? Work it out for them. All right, chances are they've been told a rate because that's what the client wants to hear. They want to hear the cheap rate. Doesn't mean that it actually correlates to the repayment. Nine times out of 10, you'll probably find it's close to eight and a half or 9%, okay? So always work it back from the repayments, right? Always come back to those repayments. Ask about, ask about upfront and ongoing fees. Dealers are really good at giving you a quote on the car and omitting the origination fee, setup costs, and account keeping fees. All right, why? Because that's, when do you think they'll tell you about those? When you're picking up the car, all right? In fact, it's actually even happened to one of our staff members. All right, he actually came to, no, no. He actually came to me to buy a car and we did the finance quote. And I think, uh, I think when we did it, I was about $3 a week more expensive than what the dealership had quoted. All right, now for whatever reason, he didn't use me. He went back to the dealership and continued to use the dealership. He went, went and picked up the car. When, they, when he picked up the car, his repayments went up by $11 a week. Right, they added two and a half grand worth of fees and charges on the spot. Now, did he sign that contract? Absolutely he did. Why? Because the car was there, it's ready to go. All right. So that two and a half grand he's now paying for over the course of his next four, four year contract. But I'm only paying 2.99% interest. <laughs> See, I didn't, even, I didn't even drop your name, you dropped your own self into that. In case you didn't guess it, it was him. <laughs> Aaron did it. <laughs> All right, so be aware of that sort of stuff as well. Also, make sure you're comparing the same repayments. Um, the one thing I didn't touch on is the balloon and residual payments on that. The, and it's gonna be difficult because we're streaming it. Can you, yeah. yep. All right, I'm just gonna quickly go through a quick example with you guys. So let's have a look at this for a second. Let's say a client's gone into a dealership Right, and they're looking at a $100,000 car. Again, this is just because I'm stupid. I need easy numbers to work with, all right? So they've gone in, they want a five year term, 30% balloon. So 30% of 100 grand is 30 grand. Everyone agree with that? Yeah, that's good, my maths works. All right, so let's say they've gone into the dealership and they've negotiated the price of the car and they've bought it for 90 grand. Good on them, they've got 10 grand off, yeah? Uh, same term, five years, 30% balloon. Uh, 27 grand, okay? 30%, 90, 27. All right, so let's say that the client and you, sorry, the broker, the dealer and you are quoting the same lender. All right, so for the sake of this, let's say it's both A and Z. Uh, rate is the same. Fees, same. Uh, account keeping fees the same, everything's the same, all right? Yet you are $50 a month more expensive than the dealership. How? No, dealership's, quoting, dealership's on 90 grand, you're on 90 grand. So borrowing the same amount, setup fees are the same, origination fees are the same, rate's the same, terms the same. Why are you $50 a month more? Balloon. Dealership has been really good. They've used that balloon. All right, so you've done it right. You've gone 90, 30%. Dealer's gone, yeah, yeah, 30% of that. All right, they'll use 30% of the recommended retail. Why? Because it makes them seem more competitive. All right, it doesn't do your client any favours at all because they're now paying, they've now got a three grand higher balloon. But this happens all the time. Right, so you need to be wary of that happening. So when you do talk to someone and they have got a balloon, make sure you are, as best you can, talking about the actual end, same end dollar amount. Right? Nine times out of 10, the client won't know that they've charged a higher balloon. And if they do, they might pick it up when they're picking up the car, in which case the dealership's just gonna turn around and go, oh, but that's okay, I've just used 30% of the recommended retail. Just because you've got a good deal doesn't mean it's gonna depreciate any quicker. Besides that, your car's there, ready to go. All right, and they'll cop it. So. Uh, it's always going to be a dollar 
figure, but it's just a, a percentage thereof. So uh, typically, which I'll talk about the balloons in a minute, but on a five year term, most lenders won't go past 30%. If in deal space, we'll talk about it in a minute, it's different, but for a third party, it's, it's typically capped at 30%. All right, so let's look at some subvention stuff. Oops, um, I'll give you one of those, pass it around. Again, these flies will be available to you all after the, uh, after the session. Um, so you've probably seen in the marketplace the 0%, the 1%, 2.99%, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's all smoke and mirrors. If anyone's ever been past a dealership when they've got the big banners up and you can't see in, you know, you might have seen like a red and white bannering uh, with an archway that you can, they sort of funnel everybody into. That's, that's what they call a main event sale. They're really good at getting people hyped up, thinking that there's amazing deals behind the curtains when it's just the same stuff but with fancy banners and balloons and stuff. Uh, what it does is it generates hype and brings people either forward two weeks in the marketplace or does nothing at all, it just depends on the manufacturer. This has the same sort of concept, uh, the zero percents and that sort of stuff. What it does is it, it, it actually taps into the fear and the fear is that we're paying too high an interest rate, right? So it brings it back down to the thing that we don't really want to talk about, but it makes it easy for us to work with. So it's always, it's always on new cars, it's never on used cars, right? it's always on new cars, it's usually on a particular stock item or a particular model, usually. Um, it could be something that they're trying to clear out from the previous month, uh, sorry, previous year, something along those lines. Uh, when I was with Lexus, they did it on every single model every single year around September, they called it Lexibition, did my head in. Um, but it's an, it's an arrangement between the manufacturer, the financier, and the actual dealership itself. All right? So they're all, they've all got some sort of tie-in you may have heard the saying, you don't get something for nothing. That's exactly what this is, all right? If you think about it logically, what's the reserve bank interest rate at the moment? One and a half. So if I've got somebody that's being offered 0% interest, yet we've got the reserve bank at one and a half, how does that even mathematically work out? It doesn't. Right? There's no free money. So where is it coming from? It's coming from the price of the car. All right? It gets built into the purchase price of the vehicle. Now, they're not legally allowed to charge you more for the car, but they certainly don't have to discount it, okay? And that's what it is. Your discount is the fact you're getting 0% or whatever it might be. Now, the flyer I've got for you there is it's actually an example based on a Holden Captiva, which was done at 0.5%. So Holden had a campaign on their Captivas at 0.5%, okay? Now, the purchase price of the car was $41,500. That's the recommended retail price of the car. So your manufacturer's rebate or discount is zero. You don't get a discount. Why? Because your discount is the fact that you're getting 0.5. Right? They've already factored in how much it's going to cost them to do this. Then you finance that 41 and a half. You've got your monthly repayment in this particular example at 733, and then you pay back a total amount at the end of that term of say 44 grand. Now, on the flip side is, is you would actually do it with a rate attached to it. All right. So in the example I've got there is five and a half percent. All right. And that was the base rate at the time. Okay. So 5.5% was the base rate. Now, we rang a Holden dealership and got $6,760 off the price of the car. Right? All I said was paying cash. Didn't tell them about finance, just say I'm paying cash, how much? That's how much I got off. Now, if you use a car buying service, you'll probably get the same sort of result. All right? That's what you need to do. You need to understand that this actually works for the client. Now, obviously I'm gonna finance a lower amount, which is 34740. The payments are obviously less because I'm financing a lesser amount even though my rate is higher. All right? And this is why I said to you before, rate doesn't make that big of a difference. It's actually what we're borrowing that makes the difference. And then we pay back on that loan about 40 grand, just under 40 grand in fact. So which one's gonna be better for the client? Obviously the one with the rate attached to it. The thing is you need to have that conversation with the client to help them understand that that's how it works. Because right? the last time I checked, there's not too many people that go to a barbecue and say that they could offer them 8% finance as opposed to 0.5 and they go, ooh, can I have the 8% please? All right? It doesn't work like that. Oh, technology at its best, guys. Let's have a look. So I'm about to show you an example of where the difference of the 0.5 to 8.75 is minimal. Yep, we're nailing it here. 
Um, so basically, if we've got a purchase price or recommended retail price, it's uh, 47500 in this particular one. Mm. Mm. There we go. Sorry, I had to go back to the start. There we go. All right. So we've got a retail price, we've got a discounted price. Now in this particular example, I've got a trade-in. Um, now that could be a cash deposit. It really doesn't matter. Six grand. It's a nominal number. We've got a changeover amount. Now the establishment fees for this example, I've left the, the dealership at zero because I actually don't know what they were charging as a uh, dealership uh, establishment fee. Now that could have been 500 bucks, could have been 300 bucks. No idea. But I've left it at zero. On ours, it was 400. So I put it at 400. So I obviously added that on to the amount borrowed. Now the other thing you need to be aware of, and I encourage you to have a look at this, when you get, you know, when you get the, the Friday paper with all the motor stuff in the Sunday, in the, sorry, in the Herald Sun, um, have a look at the fine print on some of those deals. Right? They'll actually tell you that it's dictated to you as to what term and what balloon you're allowed to do. Okay? So you'll find most of the time it's probably dictated about three years with a percentage of a balloon, which this one was. So we had to do it over three years for, for comparison purposes. So you can see here, we're only $5 a month cheaper, but I'm at 8.75. Right? So it's a fair difference in rate. The reason why we're still $5 cheaper is because of that discount that we had on the price initially. Now obviously, if they're paying cash, this is irrelevant. Right? But if they're actually financing the car, this is actually in their favour. Yes, it's only $450 by the end of the term, Still $450 in their pocket as opposed to the dealerships. Make sense? Now, a better conversation would be to actually find out how long they want to keep the car for because if it's someone that wants to keep the car or hand it to another family member down the track, you could find out that they actually want to keep it. They'll refinance it at the end of that term. You've got to then add another establishment fee because we've got to do a new contract. We pay it out over the term. We add another 24 months, which is two years and then we pay back a total there of 44 grand. Now, the better conversation would be, well, why don't we just finance it over five years? No balloon. All right, finance it over five years, no balloon. Your repayments are now 708 over the term. I'm still at 8.75 in this. I haven't changed the rate, but I'm at 708. I mean, I could do it at 7.5 7 and I'll probably end up being around about 670 bucks thereabouts. All right, and that's still very good for the client, but it's saving the client there that money. Best part is, is if I then, if the client goes, oh yeah, but I'm not sure, I might want to get out in three years time, okay, great, no worries. I can tell you now, your payout here at three years, even with penalties, is going to be less than what that balloon is. Why? Because you're paying principal and interest on the entire amount. Whereas here, you're paying principal and interest on the difference between 14 and a half and 41 and a half, but you're still accumulating interest on that 14 and a half the entire time. So you're only reducing the principal by that short amount as opposed to reducing the principal on the whole amount. Okay? Does that make sense? Uh, actually, if anyone ever queries that, the, do it yourself. Have a, look, have a look on the system yourself. Do, do the same rate, put a balloon in there, and put no balloon in there. I guarantee you the one with no balloon will always be cheaper over, as a total cost. Will always be cheaper. So the cheapest way to finance a car is actually with no balloon, but obviously a balloon makes a more expensive car more affordable. So let's have a look at an ad that you may have seen in the, in the press at some point in time. Uh, this is already a couple of years old, so don't, uh, don't get too excited, but Lotus actually did an ad at 2.99%. Alright, so what they've done is they've done the 2.99% on the Lotus Elise. They've clearly put it in front of a Formula 1 car because that makes it even sexier than what it was before. Yep. Um, so they're trying to you know, talk about their Formula One family heritage and, and genes. Now, if you actually go through it, the 2.99% has got a little comparison rate with a little asterisk next to it. They'll all do that. Read it. Read the fine print. That one actually turns around and says that the 2.99% is based on the example given only. The example given is $30,000 over three years with 30% 30, 30 deposit. So I've got to tip in 30% and no balloon. So 30% of 30 is 21. So now I'm at 21 grand, because I've got to tip in nine grand. So realistically, I'm borrowing 21 grand 
at 2.99%. How much do you think that car is? Not 21 grand, not 30 grand either. But if anyone can get me that car brand new for 30 grand, let me know, because I probably would buy one. Yeah. Create my own go-kart track. <laughs> that car starts at 90. So where's the other 60 grand coming from? And what's that being financed at? Because that 2.99 is relevant only for the example given. It then also goes on to say that it may not include the fees and charges being origination fees, establishment fees, ongoing account keeping fees. If it says it may not, I can guarantee you it doesn't. Okay, so be very wary of that sort of stuff as well. Always talk about repayments. I've had, I've had brokers talk to their clients that have been up against the 2.9s and the 1.5s or whatever it might be, and if you actually marry the repayments, they've actually been less on a, at a full interest rate on the same price. So be aware of that too. Um, guaranteed buybacks, who's heard of these before? of you? Okay. Basically this is to give comfort to those that have had a, a situation where they've been caught with that negative equity piece. Okay. I don't want to get caught with negative equity again. Well don't worry about that. We've got guaranteed buyback. Right. You don't have to worry about it. That means that whatever we've got on this contract we're guaranteeing you that that car's going to be worth that at the end of the term. Doesn't get much easier does it? Asterix. <laughs> Asterix fine print. Exactly right. Um, the problem with it is, and a lot of people don't realise this, typically they're done at a four year term, okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, your kilometres are actually restricted, alright, if you actually read the fine print, you're actually usually restricted to about 15,000 k's a year. Now if you think about your own driving habits right now, I can tell you now that's 300 k's a week. Who's driving less than 300 k's a week today? One. Can you guarantee that you will not drive another over that 300 k's for the next four years? No. Right? Nobody can, right? but that's what, they, that's what they base it on. And what they do then is they'll charge you for every kilometre that you go over that amount. Right? So on a four year term you're allowed to do 60,000 k's. For every k over you get charged and that charge is somewhere around 8 to 10 cents a k, thereabouts. Okay? Which isn't a lot. Right? But nobody drives in at the end of that term and goes, oh 60,001, oh, sorry about that, there's your 10 cents, I'm out. Right? It doesn't happen like that. It's always thousands of kilometres over. Now Mercedes-Benz are really good, they charge you 50 cents a K. Right? That adds up even quicker. Right? It just keeps ticking over. I've actually got a broker in Queensland who's got a Mercedes-Benz sitting in his garage for that exact reason. Because right? he didn't even realise it happened. The other thing too is they put wear and tear provisions on the car. Why? Because they need the car to come back in as good a condition as it left the showroom floor. All right? They don't want a car that comes back with more hits and Elvis on it. It needs to be in good nick. So what they'll do is they allow you, very generous of them, to allow you to have one scratch for every three panels on the car. That's very nice, isn't it? All right. Now there's 13 panels on a car, so that means you're allowed to have four scratches. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to how big the scratch is allowed to be? Centimetre. Centimetre? It's actually two and a half. So you guys are harsher than dealerships, I'm impressed. It's actually two and a half centimetres. In the old Imperial sense, one inch, okay? No, they do not aggregate and allow you to do a 10 centimetre scratch. <laughs> it is in, in every single instance, all right? Now, the thing is, with, with being, if you have a chance to have a look, if you jump on the, um, if you jump on the Mercedes-Benz website and have a look, they have a thing called the credit card test. So basically, it means that if the scratch fits within the credit card, it, you don't have to pay. Do you think they hold the card like that? They hold it like that. All right. So if it fits within that, you don't have to pay. Now I'm surprised they actually don't hold it like that, <laughs> but it is what it is. All right. So you need to be aware of that sort of stuff. Um, you're restricted on who can actually repair the vehicle, who can service the car. It has to be serviced by them. Right? It has to be repaired by someone that they've told you can repair it properly. Right? It can't just go to anyone. Why? Because they've got it in their contract. And the moment you go outside of this, what have you done? You've breached a contract. Therefore, what's your guaranteed buyback? Guaranteed nothing. All right. The reason why they do it is because they want you to come back. All right. BMW call it full circle. There's a reason why you call it full circle. Why? Because you've come full circle. You have to come back. If you've got that BMW and you now decide you want to buy an Audi or a Merc and you roll into the Audi or Merc dealership and get it valued and it doesn't meet your guaranteed buyback, 
Do you think they're going to go, oh, sorry, we'll pay that? No, because it's only going to be valid at that dealership or that brand. And even then, they'll weasel their way out of it anyway. Okay? So if you've got someone who's looking at this type of contract, there's a reason. The reason is they've either been stung with negative equity before or they've been sold the dream. Right? The dealership's done their, done their best and sold them the dream and they're like, oh, it's best. Explain to them the pitfalls and I can guarantee you they'll jump out just as quick. The thing to be mindful of is if they are worried about the uh, resale, put them in a lower balloon. All right? Typically, there's a four-year 40% balloons. Do it on a four-year 30. All right? Just drop the balloon. They can do as many cases as they like. They can just drive it as a per normal. Keep the balloon at 30% and they shouldn't get stung with negative equity unless they've absolutely trashed the car. Right, again, there's a caveat on that, depending on the brand and all that sort of stuff. Like if it's a Saab, which don't exist anymore, but if it's a Saab, don't do that. Just don't finance it. Um, but yeah, so that, does that make sense? Because right. there are some cars that hold their value and some that don't. But one of the key things is, is when you're talking about balloons, this is where dealerships get really, really tricky. I've seen contracts come out of dealerships on five-year term with 50% balloons on it. There is no way a car is worth half of its value after five years. It doesn't happen. And you know what? People will say, oh, but it's an expensive car. They fall quicker than the cheap cars. All right, you've got more likelihood of a Toyota Yaris meeting a five-year 50% term than you do of a BMW 7 Series. All right, why? Because at that high end, you've got so much luxury car tax and GST involved that that's what drops straight away. If I'm buying a $150,000 motor car, I can tell you now there's about 30 to 35 grand of taxes just on that car alone. Now, can I on sell those taxes? But the dealership will base the balloon on that 150 and put you into a five year term with a 75 grand balloon on it happily. All right? And people will do this. I've seen them do it. What the example of a client who had an Aston Martin and it's just hanging off that and it's got $100,000 short. Shortfall. So there you go. I actually had something similar when I was in the trade. I had a guy that had a um, BMW 7 Series, uh, had it for 12 months, paid 260 grand for it. Same thing, had enough. It, for whatever reason, this particular car was dogged with problems. Um, was getting out of it into a Lexus at the time. We, the best we could get for it was 110 grand. That's 130 grand wiped off like that. So it's well that it gives the opportunity. Yeah, that's right. It opens up the opportunity for used cars, used car buyers to pick up a good good car at a good price. If you have got someone that's entertaining the idea of a high balloon like that, and I will preface that in third party, we can't do that. We can't go to fifty percent balloons. We can't go to forty five percent balloons. We can't do that on a five year term. Typically, we're capped at five years thirty, four years forty, and three years fifty. That's where we're at. Okay. If you've got someone that's actually entertaining that idea, show them the glasses guide value of that car that's already five years old. Now, it's easier to do with the Mercs and the BMWs because they tend to keep the same model series as, as they do normally, all right? Um, but I had another example where it was a, I had a broker ring me. The, a Hyundai dealership was trying to put their client into a five-year term with a 50% balloon on a Hyundai Tucson. All right, they were saying that the car would be worth $22,000 at the end of five years. Now, that car hasn't been out for five years, but I jumped on Glasses Guide and found a, a 2015, because this was last year that I did this, a 2015 model. Any idea what the 2015 model was already worth? 24 grand. So how's it going to be worth 22 grand in another four years' time? Show them. Now, if they're still stupid enough to do it, so be it. Walk away. Just go, look, I've tried. All right, but don't beat your head up against a brick wall trying to convince them. If they're stupid enough to do it, even after you've showed them, that's their problem. All right. Does that make sense on the balloons though? Yeah, happy with that? Yeah? All right, so let's assume that you've done the deal, it's gone through the processing team, it's gotten approved, all right? You've told your client, you know, great news, car loan's approved, ready to go, when do you want to pick up the car? When do they want to pick up the car? Before the weekend. Always before the weekend. People want to drive their car on the weekend. That's fine, so you let us know that you want the car done and dusted, like settled, before the weekend. This is where it's gonna get ugly, all right? Our team will actually chase the invoice from the supplier for you. That's what we do, that's part of what we do, okay? 
The problem you're going to have is that the moment the dealership knows that the finance isn't going through their dealership finance arm, what do you think is going to happen? They're ringing the client. They're on the phone to your client there and then. Right? They're not worried about presenting an invoice to us so that we can get it paid out. They couldn't give a rat's ass. What they are going to do is go, shit, I'm missing out on the finance. I've got to get on this client. So they're going to ring your client right? and the conversation is going to go something along these lines. So if I'm the dealer, Steve's the client, I'm going to ring Steve and go, hey Steve, it's Brent from uh, such and such dealership. How are you going? Oh yeah, good. Yeah, no worries. Um, strange thing happened today. I've got an invoice request here for your car. I thought you were paying cash. So he goes, oh yeah, no, look, I ended up talking to my mortgage broker and, uh, or finance broker and uh, we got talking and, and it turns out he's actually got some really good options available for me. So we've decided to finance it through that channel and I'm going to go down that path. Oh, oh okay. That's a shame because uh, here at the dealership, we've got, you know, we've got uh, some fantastic offerings at the dealership. In fact, we're so competitive, we never miss out. Oh, oh okay. So I'm already planting the seed. All right, so he's like, yeah, yeah, no. Look, I appreciate that, right, because he wants the car. So he's like, yeah, no, look, I, I appreciate that. But, you know, I'm just happy to deal with my, my finance broker and happy with that. Look, I understand that. And obviously, you've got that relationship there with your finance broker. So I'll tell you what I'll do. How about if I give you a quote just to keep your broker honest? I'll give you a comparison quote just so we can keep your broker honest. How do you think, what do you think about that? What's he going to say? He's going to say yes. Why? Because every single one of us has got that niggly feeling in the back of our head that thinks we're being shafted by someone somewhere. Right? That's what happens. I get it. So, of course, I'm going to say yes or Steve's going to say yes. Now, there's two ways I could do this. I could go straight out bullet of gates and go, okay, what did your broker quote you? What's he going to say? He's going to say, no, mate, you just, you just tell me what you can do. All right? Or I go back to the question set. All right? As a dealership, it's a little bit different because I'll have a copy of the contract. And I'll say, oh, so Steve, I've got your copy of the contract here. Uh, I can see, okay, so you've bought the, uh, oh, you bought the Mazda, the new one. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I've driven that myself. It's really nice. Uh, oh, you got the red. <laughs> yeah, the red does go faster. Right, so then they'll go through that side of it because why? Because they're getting him excited about the car again. All right, he's having an awkward conversation with the car dealership about finance. You've got to get him excited again. So that's what the dealership will do. Right, and then they'll start asking some questions around the fact that even though on the contract it's got his personal name on it, they'll say, so is the car being used for business or is it going into your personal name or is it going into a business name? Oh, no, 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 it's going in my own name. Okay, so it's not being used for business? No, 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 no. Okay, great. And, and how long are you going to finance it for? Yep, okay, so you're financing five years, fantastic. And I'll notice here on the contract, you've got a deposit of uh, $1,000. Are you leaving that in there or are you going to get that back out? Are you financing the full amount? Okay, so you're financing the full amount, you expect that $1,000 back, fantastic, okay, good. Now, are you putting a balloon on it at all? Yep, okay, what was the balloon? 30%? 30%? Okay, no worries. And uh, sorry, what were the payments that your broker quoted you? Do you think he tells me now? <coughs> Absolutely, all right. It's like training a monkey. If you ask them enough positive affirmation questions that they come back to you and give you a response in the positive to say, yep, it's this, yep, it's that, yep, it's this, I can just roll in another question on the back of that and I'll answer it because they're in the habit of answering the questions. All right? It's just mind tricks, but it happens. So as a dealership, that's what will happen. And he'll turn around and go, oh, yeah, well, it's $550 a month. Oh, okay, great. Now, as a dealership, I've got all the pieces of the puzzle. I'll make some idle chit-chat. I'll work out the numbers while, in, while he's on the phone, and I'll go, okay, so, um, sorry, Steve, so how long did you say you'd known your, your finance broker for? <coughs> oh, right, oh, okay, and they've done your home loan, yep, okay. Oh, and your investment, oh, right, oh, okay. Yeah, look, there's probably no real easy way for me to say this, but uh, I, I could have actually saved you $50 a month on your repayments. Yeah, what have I just done to you as a broker? Trust. Oh, trust. credibility, see you later gone, right? doesn't matter how much they like you, how much they trust you, your credibility is shot. Right? How do you get back from that? Regardless of whether I could beat it by $50 or not, right? they don't know that I've just upped a balloon or done all, they don't know what I've done. All I've said is I could have beaten it by $50 a month. What do you do? I'll give you a hint, there's not much you can do, all right? Unless you have got the most loyal client known to mankind that's happy to pay $50 a month more, you're fighting a losing battle. 
The only way or best way you can do this is to have this conversation with them when you tell them it's approved. Okay, so when you ring them to tell them that loan's approved, have this conversation with them. They're going to ring you. They're going to try and win the finance back. They're going to tell you things and do things that they can't do. They'll up balloons. They'll do all sorts of wonderful things just to discredit me. All right? And what they're doing is stalling it so that you can't pick up your car before the weekend. So what I need you to do is when you get that call, can you just tell them to send the invoice through so that we can get the documents to you ASAP? Oh, okay, no worries. So you've planted the seed to start with. Now when they get that phone call, they're going to say, oh, yeah, that's right, Brent told me this was going to happen. Yeah. Can you just send through the invoice? I just want to pick up the car for the weekend. Right? It's already getting in their head before the dealership does. Right? And that's what it is. It's like a game of cat and mouse. Spot on. Think of it as a retention team. Yep. Yep. It's exactly the same thing. Okay, so think of it as a retention team in the mortgage space. That's your dealer trying to win the business. All right, so have that conversation up front. So some of the stuff that dealers will do, they won't send the invoice through because they're obviously on the phone to your client. Uh, or they'll send through an invoice but it'll have the wrong details on it. Why? Because they're stalling. Absolutely. Uh, they won't return the phone calls. This is when the dealership's receptionist becomes a guard dog. Right? We're ringing through the dealership. We're asking for the business manager. She's saying, no, nah, I'm sorry, they're unavailable. We go, yep, no worries, leave a message. And it happens over and over again. Why? Because the business manager's worded up the receptionist and says, hey, if such and such calls, I'm busy. Right? Don't think it doesn't happen. They advise the client that the funds haven't cleared so they can't pick up their car. This is literally just to annoy the client. All right? Even if it's an arts, like a real-time settlement, they will do this just to upset the client and tell the client that they should have used them because they wouldn't have had all this drama. So that next time, they finance it through them. All right? It's got nothing to do with that. All right? It's not that you guys are incompetent, it's just the dealership going wah, 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 wah in their ear. Okay? So educate the client that this is, this is what happens. So at the end of it all, obviously, you need to review your, uh, review your own business. All right? As I said right at the beginning, think of yourselves as finance brokers, not mortgage brokers. All right? You guys can do all aspects of finance in this space. I've gone through some of the, obviously, background, I've gone through some of the types of facilities available. Um, the, uh, the portal, which is Bolt, I'm not going to go through today, but there is a, web, a webinar available to you on uh, the Connective Wiki. There's also a frequently asked question page available for Bolt on the Wiki as well, which you can go through. Um, and obviously uh, we can help you out if you've got any questions around that. Look at ways of how you can integrate asset finance into your businesses. All right? As I said, look out when you're doing your, your assets and liabilities on the home loan. Have that conversation then. Talk to your tradies. Isolate your market, your databases into certain market segments. If you've got a whole heap of self-employed tradies that have done consumer mortgages, doesn't mean that they aren't doing business car loans or equipment loans. Right? The amount of things that get uncovered by mortgage brokers in this space is unbelievable. All right? I've seen $5 million worth of mining equipment get financed because it started as a mortgage. All right? It happens. But if you don't ask the question, you're never going to find it. Okay? And you've got support from obviously the dedicated BDMs, which is Phil Meehan up in uh, New South Wales and Queensland. So there's his details there. And obviously Stephen Light who looks after Vic, SA and WA. I apologise for the photos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, but that's, that's it for me, guys. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you've gotten a fair bit of information out of today and take away and utilise in your own businesses. But um, like I said, you've got the resources there to talk to us. You've got marketing resources available to you. There's templates in Mercury that you can use to send out to your database. You've just got to start doing it. That's all it is. All right, it's about making those clients stickier and making some more income on the way through. Thank you very much.